Welcome to the Introduction to Computer Science, Security and Privacy. This is Lecture B. The component, Introduction to Computer Science, provides a basic overview of computer architecture, data organization, representation and structure, the structure of programming languages, and networking and data communication. It also includes the basic terminology of computing. The objectives for this unit, Security and Privacy, are to Define cybercrime and cybersecurity. List common information technology, or IT, security and privacy concerns. List the hardware components that are usually attacked by hackers. Explain some of the common methods of attack. Describe common types of malware. Explain social engineering methods used by cybercriminals. Describe methods and tools available for protection against cyber attacks. Describe practices designed to minimize the risk of successful cyber attack. Address specifics of wireless device security. Explain security and privacy concerns associated with electronic health records, or EHRs. Describe security safeguards used for healthcare applications. And provide the basics of ethical behavior online. In this lecture, we will explore some of the hackers' more commonly used methods of attack describe common types of malware, and explain some of the social engineering methods used by cyber criminals. Hackers use software known as a packet sniffer to read internet traffic. An attacker lurking in a wireless cafe may be able to view all internet traffic on that wireless network by using a packet sniffer. The hacker could capture the usernames and passwords of everyone in the cafe, which would be especially devastating if someone logged into their bank or credit card account while using the cafe's wireless. Another hacker's method is to infect computers with malware such as adware, spyware, trojans, viruses, worms, and rootkits. Hackers also try to guess usernames and passwords and use social engineering techniques such as phishing to obtain sensitive information. We will talk more about each of these later in this lecture. Malware is a broad term for software that is used by hackers and criminals. There is some overlap in the definitions and functionalities of some malware types. According to Wikipedia, malware, short for malicious software, is any software used to disrupt computer operations, gather sensitive information, gain access to private computer systems, or display unwanted advertising. Most computer users likely have experience with some form of malware. You may have inadvertently clicked on a file which, in turn, forced installation of some software on your computer. Although you didn't approve the installation, it happened anyway. Or maybe you visited a web page and clicked on a link or button on the page that automatically installed software on your computer without your knowledge or consent. Everyone finds this experience frustrating, so everyone must be mindful when opening email attachments, opening unfamiliar files, and clicking any links and buttons when surfing the web. Types of malware include Trojan horses, viruses, worms, macroviruses, rootkits, adware, spyware, ransomware, and scareware. We will examine each of these in the following slides. The name Trojan is based on an analogy with the Trojan horse from Greek mythology. Just like in that story, this type of Trojan horse is not what it seems to be. Trojan horses, or simply Trojans, are malware programs disguised as useful and harmless software. The user gets tricked into installing a Trojan by a misleading description or advertisement. Sometimes, Trojans get onto your computer as malicious code injected in otherwise legitimate software. An installed Trojan may start acting immediately, or it may wait a certain amount of time set by the hacker who created the Trojan. Delaying a Trojan's activation makes it more difficult to control or prevent damage. Many Trojans steal sensitive data for use by the hacker in blackmail schemes. Other Trojans destroy data found in the machine it's installed on or across entire networks. Some Trojans install other unwanted software. Others display unsolicited advertisements. Sensitive information such as bank accounts, passwords, or even keystrokes can be transmitted back to the attacker from the Trojan. When executed, a virus replicates by inserting copies of itself into other computer programs, operating system files, data files, boot sectors of the hard drive, or any other drive attached to the computer. 
Viruses can be transmitted to your computer from another computer on the same network, from an infected external drive that got connected to your computer, or from opening a malicious email attachment. Viruses can do a number of nasty things to your computer, including reformatting your hard drive, corrupting data, accessing private information, spamming your contacts, logging your keystrokes, and consuming infected computers' resources, such as CPU time or hard disk space. Viruses can also display unwanted advertisements and redirect web browsers away from the site you are trying to access. In extreme cases, viruses can render a computer completely useless. For example, some viruses disable important operating system functionality, such as the ability to back up a hard disk. Some viruses will reformat a hard disk. The majority of the existing viruses are designed to infect computers running the Microsoft Windows operating system. When trying to remove a virus, you must be sure to eliminate all replicas of that virus. If even a single replica remains, the computer is still infected. Often, the best option for getting rid of a virus is to format the hard disk and reinstall the operating system, or restore from a virus-free backup. According to the online version of PC Magazine, Macro language is a special purpose command language used to automate sequences within an application, such as a spreadsheet or word processor. Microsoft Office applications commonly use macros written in the Visual Basic for Applications, or VBA, macro language for good purposes. Macro viruses can take advantage of Microsoft Office applications because those applications allow programs written in a macro language to be embedded in Microsoft Office documents spreadsheets, or even email. A macrovirus gets activated when a computer user clicks a file in which the macrovirus resides. Once installed, macroviruses can be as harmful as any other malware. It is important to be aware of those risks when receiving files and or emails from an untrusted source. If the sender is not known or trusted, it is best to not even click on the email or its attachment because that simple act may activate the macro. Some email programs quarantine suspicious email, preventing it from doing harm to the system. Unlike a macrovirus or a trojan, a worm is a standalone malware program. A worm spreads itself through computer networks by exploiting security vulnerabilities. Worms install a backdoor on the infected computer. A backdoor is a stealthy method of bypassing normal computer system authentication. The worm gains complete control of the computer and turns it into a zombie, or bot. Networks of such computers are referred to as botnets and are commonly used by spammers for sending unsolicited email. Botnets are also used for attacking other computers or websites. Worms can create a lot of network traffic and merely by their presence may cause significant harm to a network by consuming bandwidth. This is a screenshot from the Graphical User Interface, or GUI, of Beast. Beast is a Windows-based backdoor trojan, commonly known in the hacking community as a remote administration tool, or a RAT. This trojan remains harmless until it is opened. When opened, it uses the code injection method to inject itself into other applications. Once that happens, it gives the hacker full control over the infected computer. A rootkit is malware that actively conceals its actions and presence. Rootkits conceal themselves by removing the evidence of the original attack and activity that led to the rootkit's installation, gaining control over the system, installing additional malware, and hiding the files, processes, and network connections that it uses. Removal of a rootkit can be extremely difficult, and frequently it is more time and cost efficient to reformat the hard drive and reinstall the operating system and all application software. Adware does what its name suggests. It downloads and displays unsolicited ads. It can also redirect web search requests to certain advertising websites. Some adware collect data that can be used for targeted marketing, such as the types of online purchases you make, which websites you visit and how often you visit them, or the content of your web searches. Based on this information, customized advertisements can be displayed. Usually, adware is downloaded and installed without the user's knowledge. A computer can get infected with adware by visiting an infected website that results in unauthorized installation of adware. 
adware being embedded in otherwise legitimate applications, and use of hacker technologies. Strictly speaking, not all adware is considered malware. Only adware that installs and operates without users' consent is regarded as malicious. Spyware covertly collects information about a person or organization and transmits that information in the background to another entity. Spyware can collect almost any type of data. Data that is commonly targeted includes user logins, bank or credit account information, email contacts and addresses, keystrokes, and users' surfing habits. Spyware can also assert control over a computer without the user's knowledge. It can change computer and software settings and install additional software. This can result in slow internet connection speeds and unusual behavior of internet browsers. Ransomware blocks access to files on the infected computer. The motivation for doing this is to coerce the victim into paying a ransom to get the files released. Restricting access to a computer's data can be achieved in a number of ways, among them, locking the computer system and encrypting the files. If the victim pays the ransom, the ransomware operator may or may not remove the restriction. In some cases, there is no choice but to reformat the hard drive and reinstall the operating system and application software to get rid of the ransomware. Some versions of the ransomware display fake warnings that impersonate law enforcement agencies. These warnings may claim that the computer has been used for illegal activities, contains inappropriate materials such as pornography, or runs a non-genuine version of Microsoft Windows. Again, the user is forced to pay off the hacker or face having to do a lot of reformatting and reinstalling. Scareware produces pop-up messages falsely claiming the computer is infected with a virus. These warnings are persistent and the pop-ups usually can't be closed easily. The pop-ups often tell users to click a provided link to buy their antivirus software, which is guaranteed to clean the computer. In some cases, Scareware behaves similarly to ransomware by blocking access to files on the computer until the user buys the advertised antivirus software. Unfortunately, that software often mimics legitimate security software, but is useless in the best case and frequently is itself malware. Personal information attacks are accomplished through an activity called phishing. Phishing is an attempt to trick a user into revealing personal information to an attacker so that they can impersonate the user. For example, the attacker will send an email that appears to be from the user's bank, commonly used internet purchasing sites such as Amazon and eBay, or even from a corporation's CEO. The message asks the user to log in to verify a transaction or to verify a username and password. Clicking a link that appears in a phishing email will open a website that looks very similar to the website belonging to the institution that the phishing email is trying to impersonate. Gullible users will type in their credentials for the site and by doing so, give away valuable information. Never respond to such an email request and never click links contained therein. Banks or financial institutions, indeed any reputable internet merchant, would never send an email asking for such actions. If you are the subject of a phishing attack, contact the institution being impersonated by an attacker and report the incident immediately so that they can investigate. Most email software, such as Microsoft Outlook, monitors for phishing activity and moves suspicious email to a non-functional folder called junk email. The email is quarantined and isolated from the rest of the computer system and is not actionable as long as it remains in the junk email folder. Be wary of moving email out of the junk email folder. Doing so takes it out of quarantine. Hoaxes are attempts to convince a user of something that is not true. They usually come in the form of an email. Some hoaxes ask users to send money to someone in another part of the world. Others ask users to contribute to find missing children. In some cases, emails requesting funds for missing children are valid, but in most cases they are not. Unfortunately, there are always stories of people who respond to email requests for money from another part of the world and are scammed out of their money. For example, an email may read, Send us $10,000 and we'll send you $50,000. It may be hard to believe, but people do fall prey to these types of scams. If these types of attacks were not successful, they would cease to exist. If an email appears to be a hoax, use a search engine to determine whether the email's message is real. 
For example, if the subject line of the email contains missing child in some city, enter the text of the subject line in the search engine, adding the word hoax to the end. The search results will usually indicate whether the email is a hoax. It is important to use trusted internet sites to detect hoaxes. Therefore, when running a search, look for results from reputable sites. Snopes and Urban Legends Online are two such sites. They display an image of the email on their site and share whether their investigation reveals it to be a hoax. Never forward email chain letters, which are typically hoaxes, without verifying their source and identifying them as true. This concludes Lecture B of Security and Privacy. In summary, this lecture explored the common methods of attack used by computer hackers, described common types of malware, and explained social engineering methods used by cybercriminals.